what are we on? Not on that. We're on uh, environmentalism, right? Well, now back there in the back, once again, I've put out the last three pages of the outline, updated three pages, pages five, six, and seven. So you should have picked up three pieces of paper, but one of which is front and back, and one of which is not. And they should be pages five, six, and seven. So if you look at your new page, even your old page, five, Roman numeral 12 is what we're looking at today. Uh, environmentalism and the deification of nature. Now, um, it is not really essential, to be honest with you. This is not a, a plank, so to speak, in the study of Christian evidence. It's more of a, I, I like to look at this subject because it's more of an observation of where a society goes. An atheistic society, one that turns its back on God, the kind of silliness of the place that it goes in its um, when uh, we reject the Bible, we reject Christ. Um, and frankly, I think the best place, place to start is Romans chapter 1. I think the best description of such a society. So let's go there. And I mentioned last week, 1970 was commemoration of the first Earth Day. And we've got to celebrate the quote, Mother of Earth. Even though she's not the mother of anything. And Various pieces of legislation passed, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act. Well, nobody's against clean water. Uh, but these things have been used, of course, by people to impose their will on other people, to wreak havoc on our society. Um, and so, let's start in verse 18 of Romans chapter 8. See if this doesn't sound familiar. Things going on. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest. For God has shown it. For since the creation of the world, we looked at this verse many times, but we generally stop here. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they, that is us, the universe, are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. You know, the enlightened people of this country make fun of pantheism. Third world countries that worship rocks and trees and inanimate objects. We're doing the same thing. Not the same thing. By supposedly smart people. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And notice and worship and serve the creature or the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, so for this reason, God gave them up unto vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, homosexuality. Receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. There are both physical repercussions, <coughs> sexual activity outside of God and place boundaries, uh, and there are, of course, eternal spiritual repercussions. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness, See if this reminds you of any societies today. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, 
They are whispered, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only... Let's read this slowly. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. People will say to me, you leave your opinions, your politics, and your religion out of the pulpit. I'm sorry. That's just not the, the way the Bible speaks. I'm going to be held responsible for the people I support, the people I elect, the policies that I support. It doesn't say those who do them. It says those who approve of those who practice them. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. You know, let's live and let live. If this guy wants to be a homosexual, that's his business. I shouldn't say anything about it. Abortion, I shouldn't say anything about it. dangerous thing when we separate our religion from the rest of our life. Christianity is an all or nothing proposition. It is about everything we do, think, and say. Assumptions of environmentalism. And this includes animal rights activists. They share the same philosophical they both share the same presuppositions, philosophical positions as atheists, evolutionists, Buddhists, Hindus, New Age mystics, and the other form of humanism, animism, pantheism, paganism, from the past to the present. And to them, the material realm is all that exists, right? It's all there is. And deity resides in natural phenomena, rocks, dirt, plants, animals. God is not a personal supreme being. Uh, he's not self-existent or transcendent of the universe itself. But He's an impersonal force embedded in nature. If you want to get close to God, go, go hug a tree. Because after all, according to Star Wars, God is just what? He's the force. He's the animating force that runs through all of the physical world and universe. That's the way they see it. And so, to them, the universe was either, either popped out of nothing or was eternally or one is false, of course. Talk about that. But the physical environment has to be protected and preserved by humans at all costs. Because, you see, we're just, we're just one species among many. And by the way, we, according to them, are the most harmful species. Because we're the ones that damage everything else. And therefore, we're the enemy. And in their arrogance, it's up to us to save the planet. We can't destroy this planet. And we can't save it. It's one of Rush Limbaugh's books from many years back. He had a chapter that the earth is not, not fragile. We'll talk about that soon. Carl Sagan, you all remember him, who now knows his views are false. He's not with us anymore. Said this, I believe we have an obligation to fight for life on earth, not just for ourselves, but for all those humans and others who came before us, and to whom we are beholden, and for all those who, if we are wise enough, will come after. Our capacity to harm is great. And see, we're just another rung on the evolutionary ladder, right? And it's really, it's not so much important any one species. It's what's important is the environment in which evolution occurs. We, we've got to protect it so that evolution can continue. He also said there is no cause more urgent. Now listen to this. Because atheists and these other people always are, you know, attacking Christianity, attacking people who are religious. He says there is no cause more urgent, no dedication more fitting than to protect the future of our species. No social convention, no political system
system, no economic hypothesis, no religious dogma is more important. <coughs> it is a religion. Now, they of course would say they don't profess Christianity or some other organized religion, but it's a religion. They have their own religion. They worship nature and the environment. He says the earth is a tiny and fragile world. It needs to be, now get this, it needs to be cherished. God, of course, never told us to love the earth. He never told us to love rocks, trees, dirt, animals. He never told us to hug a tree. God said to love who? Him, number one, and other people. Yeah, and other people. Those are created in His image. So, when these people, as you know, you read the news, how militant they are about their views. We got the Green New Deal proposed. Bankrupt the country so we can save the world. So, in summary, here's the assumptions in radical environmentalism. The Creator depicted in the Bible does not exist. The universe verses either eternal or came from nothing. The created order has no plan, overriding purpose, and man is the ultimate offending culprit in his ability to destroy the planet. And the survival of the planet's features, plants, animals, whatever, depends on us, man, and not on any power power. Let's talk about the biblical and all the planet in our environment. Two crucial principles the Bible emphasizes that should shape our understanding of the Bible's position on the planet. Number one, we've already talked about this when we talked about human suffering, but I want to repeat it. God created the earth for a specific purpose. Not here by chance. That purpose is to provide human beings with an appropriate environment in which to determine what? Our eternal destiny. He created us as free moral agents. We're to experience earthly life as our one and only probationary period. And our fate will be determined by our response to God while we were in these fleshly And so, the point we're making is, is that, as Brother Warren called it, a veil of soul making. The earth is as good for the purpose that God had creating it as in any possible world that could be created. You ask me, should we be looking for life, people, little green men on other planets? No. There are none. I'm telling you, there are none. God created this earth for this one and only specific purpose. And everything He carpeted the universe with in the heavens that we see is for us. Romans 1. His attributes are clearly perceived and seen. That stuff is for us to see His power and divinity in God. It testifies to His power and glory. But Christ is not jumping around all over the universe dying on a cross 50 times for 50 other worlds. He created, according to Isaiah chapter 45, verse 18, this planet to be inhabited. Not other planets, this planet. I saw where the latest deal on the space program is. We're going to go back to the moon, which is fine. And then we're going to go to Mars. And how much money is that going to cost the American taxpayer to go to Mars? <laughs> to go to an environment, by the way, that was not created by God to be inhabited. There's a whole nother argument there, my friend. Yeah. Creating the space force also. How much that's going to cost us? Well, I don't know what the space force is for. I will. Now, if we're talking about back in the 80s and we were talking about a missile defense system in space, I can buy that. If we're creating a space force to invade other planets, no, I'm not interested in that. 
If we're creating a space force to protect ourselves from communists, I'm okay with that, depending on how much it costs. So, Genesis 1. Let's go there. What was God's intention? far as humans and their relationship to the environment. Verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion. Hmm. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Notice verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply. Fill the earth. You know, we got the environmentalists telling us there's too many people. Let's start killing. Well, we're already killing babies. Let's kill the ones that are born, too. Fill the earth. And what? What besides fill the earth? What's the word right after that? Huh? Subdue it. Hebrew word, I don't know how you say it, kabosh, means to bring into submission by force. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, Psalm 8, verse 6. Go to Genesis chapter 9. The language gets even stronger after the flood. Verse 2, and the fear of you, the fear of you, and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. I think most Bible commentators believe in that passage, and I, I don't disagree, that before the flood, both men and animals were, it would appear, perhaps they could have been just vegetarians. If you go back to Genesis chapter 2, he tells them, I've given you the, the seed, the herb yielding seed. For food. Here he says, guess what? You get to eat animals, birds, fish, and we're to use this world's natural resources to survive, develop, progress, all in preparation for eternity. Number two, first of all, he created it for a purpose. Number two, he not only set it up to fulfill a divine purpose, but he continues to do what? He set it up for He continues to sustain it. Maintain it. And this is the part where it's so arrogant on the part of people to think we can control it, we can destroy it. In John chapter 1, it said, What about Jesus? Verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. What? All things were made by Him. Without Him, nothing was nothing was made that was made. So, Jesus Christ created this universe, and He still is sustaining. He continues to have a relationship with Him. First Corinthians eight six, Paul refers to Christ as through whom are all things, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven that are on earth. All things were created through Him and for Him. Question. Do you think that we can destroy the world that the Bible says that Christ created, not only created it, but it's for Him? It's His. It belongs to Him. And He is before all things and in Him all things consist. I love Hebrews chapter 1. I think Hebrews chapter 1 is one of the most sublime chapters in the Bible. 
not a lot of fans. John chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 1. God who at various times and various ways spoke in time past and the Father by the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son whom He has appointed heir of all things through whom He also made the worlds who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person I notice upholding all things by the word of His power. Our little world spins on its axis because of Jesus Christ. Peter said that this world, the heavens and the earth which now exist, are kept in store by what? They're kept in store. They're being preserved by what? Anybody remember? The same word. So, all of these verses denote the idea of preserving, governing, regulating, superintending. Christ is maintaining order, harmony. Acts 17, 28, for in Him we what? Live and move and have our being. So what's the point? The point is, God had a purpose in creating this world. He sustains it. And it will remain intact. Until what? You know, he's done with it. Not when we're done with it. Not when we tear it up or destroy it or whatever we think we can do. Look at Genesis chapter 8. Noah comes out of the ark. We get some new information like, hey, go out and eat animals. But, by the way, don't kill people. Don't murder people. Kill me if I'm <laughs> But notice he built an altar in verse 20 of chapter 8. Offered his sacrifices. The Lord said, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Set it in his heart. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing that I have done. Now, notice verse 20. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. God says, as long as this earth remains, there's going to be winter, spring, summer, and fall. If you live in part of the world, that's the winter, spring, summer. Now, you live on the equator. Antarctica, your weather still going to be the same all year long. When I was young in the 70s, I was told by the environmentalists that what was going to happen. We're now moving to environmentalism's inconsistency. When I was in the 70s, I was told what, what changes were we going to have. The new ice age was coming. Man, it's getting colder. Got an ice age coming. Then I got older, just in the last 10, 10 to 20 years ago, I was told that getting hotter, global warming. And then when everybody said, well, wait a minute, what happened to the ice age? told us it's going to get cold, now you're telling us it's going to get hot. I guess somebody got smart and they said, well, hmm, let's call it climate change. It's going to change. We don't know if it's going to be hot or cold, but it's going to change. Let me tell you something, it changes all the time. If you live in Memphis, Tennessee, it changes on a daily, if not weekly basis. And yet we're always being uh, get these crisis headlines. It's like the weather, man. You know, when I was growing up, a storm came through. Okay, it's a thunderstorm. No big deal. Thunderstorm comes through now, man. 
I can't even watch my TV show. They interrupt it. Some weatherman telling me about the thunderstorm. What am I supposed to do with that? Where do you want me to go? You're messing up the show. But they love to scare people. Because it's ratings. I understand. So. And this is all, of course, due to bad Western civilization. Technological advances. You know, we've got to get back to the ways of the primitive folks. The way they lived thousands of years ago. And the way some third world countries still live. Which, of course, uh, is a little silly. Because I remember studying in school that old farming techniques did what? Cause severe what? Erosion. Erosion. They don't anymore. Not in this country. And then we're told, well, we're polluting too much, too much garbage. Really? Do you know who pollutes more than anybody else in the world? China. And then third world countries. Anybody ever been to Haiti to see what they do with their garbage? My daughter's been there. You know where their garbage is? It's on the beach. Their beaches are filled with garbage. But it's always, we're the bad guy. The ones that are technologically advanced. There was a guy on TV news yesterday that said, the only way to save the earth is to get rid of all the humans. <laughs> now when the guy questioned him about it, he said, are you ready to commit suicide? He wasn't hardly ready yet. Yeah. yeah, my theory on that is, when somebody suggests that, I, my theory is let them go first. <laughs> and then that theory will go away pretty quickly. <laughs> Environmentalism's inconsistencies. Look at nature versus itself. I love this example. I, I had a bunch more that we used to do, and I'm not going to go over them because, you know, it's easy to make the point. Uh, but I love this example, so I'm going to read it. This is for all of you that when you were growing up and didn't eat all your food, and your mom or dad said, Remember the starving people in wherever? Okay. Eat all your food. Don't, why are you so picky? The Katmai National Park is home to the world's largest grizzly bear commonly referred to as Alaskan brown bears. Because of their rich salmon diet, these bears grow to over a thousand pounds in weight, making them the world's largest land predators. A guy by the name of Philip Greenspun gave the following eyewitness report of the bears' eating ritual in the Brooks River. Dominant bears occupy prime positions on top of the part of the falls where salmon jump every few seconds. When the salmon are running well, every five minutes a bear will catch a fish in his teeth and hold it firmly enough that blood begins to flow as the fish, fish flops around. If there are plenty of salmon, <laughs> I love this, if there are plenty of salmon, the bear goes after only the fatty skin, brain, and roe, removing these parts during a gruesome minute or so. The salmon may remain alive for much or all of its consumption. And then he asked the question, why do you think they call them animals? Carnage, waste, brutality, selfish competition, flagrant insensitivity to the salmon, by the way, and the environment. It's typical in the animal kingdom. Here are bears who, if they have enough, are picky eaters. Man, I like this part of the salmon. I don't like that part of the salmon. I'll throw him over there. That's nature. But that's fine. That's okay if you're a bear. And I used to have a lot of other examples we'd go through, but, but basically, look at all of the natural disasters, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, rivers overflowing, tornadoes, uh, tsunamis, hurricanes. The, the environment does more destruction to itself in a year than we could do in a lifetime. You know, every time they have one of those uh, volcanoes that blows or whatever, you know, you'll read about it and say, well, it had the force of uh, 
several hydrogen bombs, you know, um, found. So, have humans done damage to the environment? Sure. A lot of times we introduce things we should. Yeah. The speaker of that, uh, I can't remember the exact year, but uh, recently, in reference, in uh, the Philippines they had a uh, volcano eruption, but I remember when my oldest son, which was in the Navy, was stationed at Subic Bay, uh, Mount Petitubo erupted. They had to evacuate. All American, well, yeah, all American. Which is kind of interesting. They evacuated, but there was so much destruction that Clark Air Force Base has never been re-inhabited, and they're not going to. And yet, we're we're going to save the planet, but when the planet decides to tear itself up, all we can do is what? Run. Yeah, well, that's exactly what they're Get out of the way. Yeah. And again, as I said, Clark Air Force Base, which was no small uh, facility. Uh, they just closed it down. It just wasn't worth trying to yeah. rehabilitate. And you know, certainly humans, if you drive around the south at all in the summer, you're going to see this vine along the interstate, right? especially in Mississippi. The cuds there. Well, that wasn't very smart. I don't know whose idea it was to bring that over from Japan. Do what? And then you got, uh, you had some, uh, I don't know who they were, but scientists or what, just had to bring some African bees over to South America to study. And let them get out. Now we've got African bees all the way up here, 30 or 40 years away. So yeah, we do things we probably in hindsight are very smart. Have plant and animal species gone extinct since creation? Absolutely. Lots. But the fact of the matter is, plants and animals going into extinction is part of the world that God set up. You know, how many dinosaurs do you see running around? And I'm glad they're not, Frank. I just don't think there's any room in my backyard for them. Um, and sometimes humans are the cause of, the, of extinction of animals or plants, but to be honest with you, most plants and animals that go extinct, they don't know. They have no, they have no, they just, yeah, they just die. And yet, we're still here, right? And with the technology we have now, we create new species of plants and animals. Do it all the time. And then what I also love is the oil spills. I love the crisis that the, the media makes out of the oil spill. Exxon Valdez, the one down here in the Gulf. And the government spends, they, they find these companies and they spend a gazillion dollars cleaning up this oil, a little bit of it. And then in a few years they find out what? Who took care of the oil? Nature did. They can't find it. I mean, the ocean took care of it. I always like the one uh, radio commentary said, why are we up so upset about oil when it's natural? It's not even gasoline. Yeah. You know, the environment said, oh, you spilled oil. It came out of the ground. It belongs here. And they can't find it. I was down in Florida a few years ago on the beach after that other one. I don't know how much they were paying these people to walk around the beach. It was little... Yes, they were, I guess they were still trying to pick up the stuff from them. I couldn't see what they were doing, but somebody had a tough job. It was hot. I wouldn't want to have been there. But still, uh, I don't want to spend that money now. So, I don't know. It's... Uh, Everything's an ecological disaster, just catastrophic portions. But the earth is restored. It heals itself. Just like your body, just like your cells do when you cut yourself. 
salmon grabbing bears, forest goblin vines, all glutting humans, just destruction everywhere. But it's self-sustaining. The earth has a purpose. It's self-healing. It's resilient. As people say, it's not fragile. The greenhouse effect God actually put in place. It's not something we do. We don't have to regulate it. We can't eliminate. I can remember when I was a kid, we had to get rid of uh, aerosol cans. We were going to destroy the Because we don't even compare to the destructive forces of nature. We have an inflated ego is what we have as people. And by the way, who has rendered the most devastating ultimate environmental damage? Any force in the universe. Who? God has. I don't know. Uh, I mean, look what happened to Egypt. And I don't know how he dealt with that. He doesn't record for us the way he dealt with all civilizations in the past. You know, Lot just happened to be living in Sodom. And that's why we have that in. What did he do to that? And of course, what did he do with the flood? He just erased the whole surface of the planet and started over. Catastrophic. Look at Pompeii, just in the, the historical parts of Pompeii. Yeah, and that's nature's violence. But God Himself has rendered the most destruction on the earth that He with the flood. So someone says, well, you just you want, to be, you want me to be wasteful? No, I don't want you to be wasteful. The Bible talks about stewardship, wisdom, and using the resources he has allocated us. And in fact, he cares for his own non-human creatures. Remember he says, Jesus said, God knows when a bird or sparrow falls. He knows all these things. You go to Exodus chapter 20 and Leviticus chapter 22 when the Israelites were enjoined to rest on the seventh day. He included animals. He said, let your animals rest. Too. What about the ox that treads out the grain? Don't muzzle him. He's entitled to his pay. And by the way, Israelites, what are you supposed to do with your farmland every seven years? Let it rest. Let it rest. So we're not talking about being wasteful or greedy or cruel or reckless, going out of our way to inflict damage or harm on the environment. But here's the point. From a biblical perspective, the environment cannot take precedence over humans. If you have a choice between a rock and a human, it's a human. If you have a choice between a tree and a human, it's the human. If you have a choice between a dog, your pet, and a human, it's got to be. We're creating His image. And if you think otherwise, then we have an incorrect view of reality, a devalued view of human life, so no wonder we don't have problems with killing the animals. And it is idolatry. Going back to Romans 1, where we start. Professing to be wise, they became folk. And worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. <clears throat> what the environmentalist needs, well, he needs the Word of God. And he needs to read where God asked Job a few questions in Job chapter 3. Arrogance needs to be brought down a little bit. Job questioned God's superintendence of the universe. He didn't sin. He didn't turn his back on God, but he had some questions. You know, why does this happen? Chapter 38 and chapter 40. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, this is my favorite phrase, one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. You see it over and over again in the Old Testament. Now, gird up your loins like a man. Put your big boy pants on, Job. Answer my questions. 
And I will ask you, and you, you instruct me, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? You know, for you were born then. And the number of your days is great. Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer. Then I will also confess to you that your own right hand, I will, God says, I will confess to you that your own right hand will save you. The environmentalist says, oh, we can save ourselves. God says, let me ask you a few questions. You want to get serious about saving the planet, according to them, their philosophy, you need to kill all the cows because of the CO2 they put out. Crops, can't hurt the plants. Children, and then when you get through, as somebody said, kill the dogs. But we are incapable of doing it, destroying the environment. Why is the environment declining? Tell them, we've already studied it. I have to pick up here to finish. It is called the law of laws of what? Thermodynamics. Think they're completely. They're wearing out. Hebrews chapter 1, and I'll leave you with this, verses 10 through 12, is a quote from Psalm 102. You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up. The earth is growing old. And it will serve its purpose until he's done. <coughs> we'll pick up here in just about five minutes. I just want to mention the relationship of animal rights to environmental. But it's basically the same principles. But with a few more specific questions.